and this is just meant to be kind of a, a high level overview. Um, and there's a lot of details that I'm probably leaving out, but uh, hopefully this should just give everyone a sense of like what's out there, because uh, there's definitely a lot. Um, so this is my version of kind of an ideal world. Um, and so the first bullet point is we figure out the learning rules involved in the brain, just copy paste them into machine learning. Um, that'd be great. Uh, I say all question mark because there seems to be evidence that there's multiple learning rules and there's multiple different learning regimes um, and different brain structures might require different learning rules, uh, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of complexity there. Um, and it would be nice if this started to work because currently Hebbian rules do not generalize to deep networks. Um, and another problem associated with this is that it's really hard to get all the learning rules from biology. So uh, as I just said, uh, biology is very complex. Um, alternatively, there is another sort of path forward, and that's that we can get to a general local learning rule first, just by experimenting and trying to find a local learning rule that, that works in machine learning. Um, and the reason this is kind of uh, a good thing is that it would allow for faster computation of weight updates, which would allow for larger and more complex networks. Um, and so the, yeah, the, the third point here is that either way, we're pretty sure that the brain is not doing backpropagation as it exists in computer hardware today. Um, and it, it, it might approximate backprop in some way, and that's definitely up for debate. Um, it's, it's very likely that something, something uh, that's sort of ground, I mean, it kind of has to be grounded in theory, and there probably does exist a nice theory that explains how this is working, um, whether it is exactly backprop uh, in, in sense of what it calculates, intermediate variables um, is definitely up for debate, and people are still looking. Um, so I was debating whether to conclude this slide <laughs> because I think we should be pretty familiar with it. But for, I guess, the folks watching on YouTube uh, or people who uh, aren't super familiar with backpropagation, this is just a very brief overview. Um, so what's happening here is you have a bunch of inputs on the left, that's x1 through xn. You also have a bias uh, node, which is just set to one. Uh, and that is all multiplied by a weights matrix uh, to then give you uh, the sort of summation of all these activate uh, all these inputs, and then you pass that through an activation function, and that's your neuron output. Um, now, backpropagation, what it does is it takes that output and says, uh, you know, should this be higher or lower? And the gradient with respect to all of these weights, and even with respect to the activation, tells you whether the value should be higher or lower. And you take your dial, each each one of these weights has a little dial, and then you turn it according to the gradient uh, going up or down, and it also has a magnitude. Um, and so backpropagation does this through the entire network. So after it goes through this neuron, it'll go through the other neurons that lead up to it. Uh, and so this is how the signal from the very end of the network at the end of the propagation, at the end of the forward propagation, goes all the way back and can tell all the weights how to update. Um, so one immediate problem with this is that uh, it's called the weight transport problem. Um, and so this formulation on the left here is exactly what I was showing on the slide before. And it's that the activations of uh, layer L plus one are the matrix multiplication of the weights of that layer multiplied by the activations of the previous layer with a bias passed through an activation function. And then uh, the equation below that is the error function, right? So you have the error, the error function is uh, the derivative of the activation function uh, multiplied by the transpose of the weights uh, and the error from the L plus one layer. And what this corresponds to visually is you can think about uh, if you have a graph and you represent a graph with a matrix uh, as, a, as a directed matrix or a directed graph with a matrix, then the transpose of the weights are just flipping all of the directed arrows backwards. And so, for example, in this last layer here, you can see that the, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse. Is that, is that visible? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we see can it. see it. Okay, cool. So then this red arrow uh, corresponds to this gray arrow going forward. And so um, the transpose of this weights matrix corresponds to these red errors here. And so um, what this looks like in biology is something like this. Uh, these are neurons, but they're represented as clouds, um, just <laughs> for lack of visual tools uh, that I could find in Google Drive. But uh, yeah, so neuron A would be connected to neuron B. And then in order to propagate the errors backwards, uh, if, if forward is to the right and backwards is to the left, then every forward connection from A to B would also have a corresponding backwards connection. Um, and this is just shown not to be the case. It's not, it's not the case that every sort of forward connection in biology has a corresponding backwards connection. Um, with, even with though the, they're, with the is, same weights, right? It has to be a backward with, connection yes. with the same weights. 
And, and if exactly. you change the weight to the forward connection, you have to change the appropriate weight for the backward connection. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so those both don't exist. And if they, you know, if it happens to exist, it's very unlikely that the same uh, update would happen on both, both uh, axons or yeah, both connections uh, in, in either direction. Uh, so that's why this is kind of biologically implausible and a reason why that propagation isn't, um, you know, as it, as it currently is formulated, a very reasonable explanation. Um, so one thing that was proposed a while ago, um, and what Jeff Hinton called a miracle, was that uh, random synaptic feedback weights support error back, back propagation for deep learning. Uh, so what does that mean? This is the same formulation on the left here with the activations and the error, but you just can swap out the weights matrix transposed for a just completely random matrix B. So B, this capital B matrix is just completely random. Um, and uh, this will still work as long as you are careful about how you update the weights of your matrix. So you can, um, I'll, I'll go into this more in detail on the, on the next slide. Um, but this picture, this picture isn't extremely informative of what's going on here, but the gist of it is that uh, you have inputs coming into this neuron being forward propagated and then this B matrix represents just a random connection going backwards. Um, and somehow the errors from the layer above are propagated backwards uh, to the layer below. And it doesn't have to be exactly corresponding to the transpose of the weight matrix. The reason it's called feedback alignment is because the, uh, if you are careful about how you update your weights, then the forward weights will come to align themselves with the backwards weights, um, which is B. And that would be, uh, that's good because then you can actually start to update and learn using these random matrices. Uh, so here's a, hey, a visual. Hey, intuition. Alex. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question with that. So here in this connect, in this scheme, you still need a one-to-one -one connection. Like every forward weight still needs a corresponding backward weight. It just, they don't have the, the two weights none don't need to be the same, right? The backward weight can be random. Um, but the, at least I the guess... way you formulated there, there's still a one-to-one every forward weight has a corresponding random backward weight. I'm not sure if that's true because you can, you don't necessarily, I mean, it depends on how you um, like initialize your, your backwards matrix, but um, I think you can initialize it with sort of randomized it, zeros and still have uh, sort oh, of this alignment happen. Um, so okay. like, I think. So it could yeah, be a this, sparse backward matrix you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this this picture is kind of, yeah, what I'm trying to to get at, and it's that as long as it's on this orange shaded half, um, then you're kind of in the clear and you can start to learn. Um, so yeah, just to just to recap here, this B times E is the errors from the random matrix going backwards, and the W transpose E is actually what you get if you had back propagation. Um, and so these, if you take the sort of dot product or the the cosine similarity between them, um, if they are at least somewhat aligned. And going in the right direction, um, you know, to the right of orthogonal, then you can actually start to learn. And so the, it's possible that you could have a bunch of zeros in this B matrix, uh, and you know that there are no backwards weights for specific weights that exist here. But as long as, as a whole, this matrix is sort of pointing in the same direction as this one, um, then it will work. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, the reason it's called feedback alignment is because you want to sort of update your weights such that these get closer and closer together. Um, and the surprise is that you can change only the forward weights to bring them into alignment. So uh, this was this experiment was actually done as a control for a different experiment just to say, okay, this was definitely not going to work. Therefore, uh, you know, we can prove that the other method will work, but this ended up working uh, because you can change these forward, uh, not W transpose, you can change the W matrix um, to align it with the B matrix and then it will, um, Work. And, that, and that's supposed to be sort of a good way to have local uh, errors propagate um, without needing the sort of biological implausibility of point-to-point -point forward and backward connections. That's a quick question. Um, it kind of looks like to me, if, if you have a random sparse matrix being the backwards matrix, it kind of implies to me that that represents a subspace and that somehow only the elements of that subspace are the ones that need to be brought into alignment with your forward direction. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, I, under, I understand that you're showing a two-dimensional representation of this, but it's if it's a high order space, 
then um, it's, it's almost like you're saying, I'm trying to find the principal component and that's the most important thing as long as I can conspire to get my random guys to more or less be aligned with you know, the principal component of what I'm trying to do, I'm okay. Is, is that mm -hmm. a fair assessment? Yeah, I think that's right. I haven't thought about it like that, but I think that's, um, yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Um, okay, yeah, so then the, yeah, so as I said before, it actually worked, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, this is a nonlinear problem on a shallow network, so it's not actually that difficult, this experiment. Um, I don't recall exactly what the data set was, but you can see here that um, in these four panels, the sort of the first and the fourth one show that this feedback alignment, which is in green, actually approximates backcrop uh, in terms of its performance. Um, I wouldn't pay attention to the fact that it's better here. I think that's probably just noise. Um, but the point is that it's pretty good. And empirically, what ends up happening is that your alignment, this, this B panel is the alignment, ends up going and converging around 45 degrees or a little bit less. Um, and so ideally it would be zero degrees, but it, it kind of bottoms out uh, at some non-zero degree. Uh, and this is just the structure of the network. So it's only a few layers deep, um, which is uh, sort of ominous for the, the future of this feedback alignment because uh, this is kind of as, as deep as it will pretty much get. Um, the Another cool experiment that was done with the feedback alignment algorithm was this multi-layer stochastic MNIST network. So um, this is kind of very reminiscent of a spiking neural network and um, PSP is postsynaptic potential and this is the error signal. Um, but what this is showing is that you can use this feedback alignment on a completely different architecture and it will still work. Um, and it's it's like solid in theory uh, and it can be used on, like again, MNIST is actually not like that difficult and this network was not very large, uh, but even still it was able to learn. And you can see that it's classifying these numbers correctly on the right uh, because the output unit is a six and this is a six on the input. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. But uh, as I said before, it doesn't scale to deep networks. So this is on the SIFAR data set. And the top one error is still like pretty bad. Um, and this is just using feedback alignment, which is FA. BP is back prop. And then, um, so what, what ends up happening is that modifications have to be made for feedback alignment to work on deeper architectures. Um, and so there's a few different proposals. There's Actually, there's a lot more than a few. There's like a ton. <laughs> but uh, one of them is direct feedback alignment. So instead of having a B matrix, uh, let me see if I can go back to this picture. Um, I don't know where it went. <laughs> it was the structure of the network. Well, anyway, <laughs> uh, so in, instead of having a, a B matrix, a random matrix between each of the two layers, er, er, every pair of adjacent layers, uh, you have a random matrix in between each layer and the last layer. And so then the errors from the last layer just go directly to each layer. Um, and then there's other there's other sort of modifications of feedback alignment um, and along these same lines with indirect feedback alignment where you have just one random matrix that goes from the very first layer to the very last layer. Um, and so there, there's a bunch of different uh, ways to um, sort of modify this. Um, another one is just uniform sign concordant feedback. Uh, which is a very complicated way of saying that you just set B to be the sign of W transpose. This should be transpose. Um, but one thing that kind of annoys me with with these proposals is that all of a sudden it becomes less biologically plausible. So if you're you know converting B to be the sign of W, then all of a sudden, um, I mean, uh, propagating or, or copying the sign between the B matrix and the W transpose matrix is kind of like just copying the real value. There's uh, a lot of information is in the sign. Uh, the fact that like the weight exists even. Um, well, well so, one, one sort of uh, one thing with you know, in biology though, the synapses are always either positive or negative. You never go from positive to negative. So once you know the sign of the synapses, that's kind of fixed for forever. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, it, that's it's true. not now here. It's it, they might be chain, flipping the sign constantly. So I don't know. But in, in biology, you wouldn't be flipping the sign. Yeah, yeah, that's a yeah, that's definitely another thing. Um, that's not even put as a as a constraint. I think this B matrix just evolves how it however it evolves. Or actually, um, okay. So then then they're the probably matrix flipping the evolved. sign. Yeah. yeah, it's the W matrix that evolves, and they're yeah. flipping the signs in the W matrix. So that's you know another biological implausibility. Um, okay, so that's kind of it for the. Um, 
first method feedback alignment. And one thing, uh, another proposal, uh, which is by Joshua Benjo, uh, was that you can swap the errors for targets with difference target propagation. So to, to put a visual to what I'm saying here, um, here's your, your network. And traditionally, you'd have, um, in feedback alignment, we try to approximate this W transpose matrix with B. And what's propagated back is the errors. But if you swap the errors for targets uh, and propagate back the targets, uh, the formulation comes different. So in order to get from, um, you know, this layer to this layer, uh, you go through this F matrix. Uh, and to get back, then you have this inverse of the F matrix. And so now, instead of trying to approximate this W transpose, you try to approximate F inverse with G. And that's what this is over here. Um, and so these are targets being propagated back, not errors. Um, and so there's, there's a whole algorithm that comes along with this, um, where you have a perturbation phase and you propagate forward and you try to make sure that when you reconstruct it, it's similar, even though it was perturbed. Um, and then you have this reconstruction loss. So it's very much like an autoencoder, um, in order to get to, uh, a working difference target propagation rule. And recently, this is actually in 2020, um, I think late 2022, uh, there was a talk and it's called a theoretical framework for target propagation where they made some modifications to difference target propagation. Um, and they changed out the sort of loss function. So then it's, I think it's called the difference reconstruction loss uh, for difference target propagation. There's a lot of terminology being thrown around here, but essentially they added in a couple extra terms into this reconstruction loss. Um, and then because they added in these extra reconstruction terms, they were able to like prove in theory that the difference target propagation updates were kind of a hybrid between great gradient descent and the Gauss Newton method, uh, which I thought was very interesting because it lended sort of credibility to the idea that not everything has to be a gradient descent step. Uh, so there's, you know, second order methods that work, uh, or that, you know, if you had uh, first order, second order, third order, um, uh, approximations to the weight updates, then that's even better. And so it doesn't, we're not all, I, uh, what am I trying to say? It doesn't always have to be just a, a single first order gradient descent. Um, and so this was a nice way to reconcile that, uh, with another sort of local learning rule. Um, okay. This one is really cool. It came out in 2016. It, this was from DeepMind. It's called synthetic gradients. Um, and there actually hasn't been much activity in here since then. Um, but I think it was very cool when it came out and it was pretty successful. Um, so the idea in synthetic gradients is that instead of uh, back propagating through your whole model to get gradients for each layer, what you do is you try to train a network, which is this sort of nice shaded box here to approximate what the gradients are given the activations of a layer. So you have activations going in and then the predicted gradient with respect to the weights of that layer coming out. Uh, and this is a network. This is a neural network in and of itself. So you've got a network that tells the other layers in the like main network how to change their weights, which I think is very cool. Um, uh, it's a quick question on that. It has no yeah. idea what the loss is, does it? It has no. No. So, so wouldn't that have a huge difference on the gradient if the loss is positive versus negative? Yes. Um, yes. So you know the gradients would flip. So. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the loss only comes into play at the very last layer. And this is somewhat similar to the idea of like feedback alignment in the sense that um, your weights are not going, or your, your gradient updates aren't gonna be doing very much in the, in the way of being useful uh, in these early layers, especially that are very far away from the loss function for many time steps, because uh, what's gonna have to happen in this is that this loss is gonna have to propagate uh, to the layer backward one time step later. And then the next time step, it will get uh, you know one layer uh, backward and it'll keep progressing backwards as you have more and more backwards passes, um, or more and more weight updates, I should say. Um, and so it takes, you know, three updates for the loss to get back to layer one, as opposed to with back crop, it just takes one. You just go straight through. Um, so why would you do this? The, the reason why they did it is because they wanted to separate out each layer and their gradient updates into like individual modules. So, what this allows you to do is run this whole thing in parallel, even though it's a feed forward network. And then you're simultaneously training this network, which is the gradients. Actually, there's one of these boxes, this gradient network for each layer, or there can be. Um, there can be you know, arbitrarily many, but the point is that these are not shared among many different layers. Each layer, if you wanted to have a synthetic gradient, it has to have its own synthetic gradient network. Um, 
But if you do that, then you can start separating out into different layers. So activations come in, gradients go out. And the way that you train this network is by getting the gradients from the layer above. So you get the gradients from the layer above, you back propagate through layer two, and then you can train the synthetic gradient network from the layer below. And that's why it takes a lot of time. So you gotta propagate all the way back by training all of these networks in succession. So um, it's highly parallelizable, but also it'll take a lot more steps. So there's a trade off there. Um, but it, in general, it's a very cool idea. It's very reminiscent of feedback alignment. What is like the objective for the um, like gradient producing network? I think it's like the reconstruction loss with respect. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a reconstruction loss with respect to the gradients um, that, so, so like, for example, this one, uh, it gets activations in and it gives it a gradient out, but then it figures out, okay, what's the gradient I actually should have given layer one from layer two. And so then it's the reconstruction loss. I think it's like the squared error between, um, you know, what it predicted and what was the actual. Um, and so then you can back propagate through that network. I see. Okay. So, okay. So that's what you were saying that like, in order for it to get a meaningful update, it would take two time steps for the information. Yeah. To, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that helps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is getting yeah. some information about the loss. So given an input, it, it eventually is told what the true gradient should be. Right. Um, it will, the loss okay. will eventually propagate backward. It just takes quite a bit of time. Okay. So it still has all of the biological implausibility issues that you pointed out in the beginning, because you still need the weight trans, in order to get the true gradient, you still need the transpose of the weights and all that stuff. Yeah. Still I, I guess, yeah, I'm not mentioning this in the sense of like being biologically plausible as opposed to just a different way of, of implementing. No, no, I, I got it. Yeah. This is mostly a, yeah. Yeah. This is a way to parallelize everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, another very interesting topic, which has uh, been somewhat popular recently in, in 2020, um, was this idea that predictive coding approximates backpropagation. Um, and so this was talked about by Rafal Bogach, I think is how you say his name, in the Brains at Bay meetup that Umenta hosted, uh, which was a really great talk. And then there's also a really great paper called Predictive Coding Approximates Backprop Along Arbitrary Computation Graphs. Um, and the idea here is that you can use heavy and learning rules on a modified network um, of, of neurons that consist of error neurons and value neurons to um, sort of approximate what would have been backpropagation. Um, and so this was kind of proven out in a theory paper. And then there are simple examples that have been sort of tested as well with this sort of structure. Um, but a lot, so there's there's been a few like major criticisms of, of this work and that's that you have to have error nodes and value nodes and they must correspond like one-to-one, -one, right? So for every error node, you have a value node um, and then they must be connected as well. And that is, somewhat implausible. So um, the good news is that there's actually been even more for, like further progress and that assumption has been removed. Um, you don't have to have exactly one-to-one -one correspondence between error nodes and value nodes. Um, you can also relax the weight transport assumption here um, with something similar to feedback alignment. Um, and then there's other work that's extended the, the predictive coding networks that map to like dendrites. So this is like giving a one of these predictive coding networks can be formulated as being implemented by dendrites on, on different neurons, um, which is interesting. And then, the, the, yeah, and then it's worth noting that all of this predictive coding stuff is happening on Hebbian learning rules. So the weight update is a function, purely a function of pre and post synaptic activity. This is something that Subutai just sent to me a paper uh, a little bit ago, and I thought it was very cool and definitely worth mentioning here. Um, so we've talked about various different learning rules, but um, one thing that you can do, and that is, this is work that just came out recently, so you can infer a learning rule from the weight updates. So um, let, me, let me explain a little bit more here. What you have is a bunch of different networks and a bunch of different tasks with a lot of different data sets. And you train those networks using various different uh, sort of optimizers, right? So you got Atom, you got SGD with momentum, you got information alignment and feedback alignment. And each of these optimizers will take a different trajectory through the loss landscape. And this is you know, just a toy. Um, but the idea here is that you can look at the activations of the, uh, you know, in, in each layer, you can look at the, um, you can look at the layer position, uh, you can look at the weights and you can look at the layer wise activity changes. So taking the, you know, the average weight of one layer and comparing it to the average weight, uh, average activation of the next layer. 
and they will all lead to sort of different paths through this loss landscape. And um, you can classify which optimizer a network is using to be trained from these features. So you can find out what optimizer is being used just by looking at the trajectory that the weight updates take, um, which is really cool. And that's that's what this is here. So with 99% accuracy, you can classify, you know, um, when when a neural network is being trained with Atom, when it's being trained with SGD, and information alignment or information alignment and feedback alignment. Yeah. Um, and the, so there's. That? I'm confused. Why would you want to? This is like in, this is like inferring what the learning rule that was used. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah, so you can infer. Yeah, what the what the optimizer was. Um, What's it and why? What I'm what is the goal of doing that? Why would you want to do that? I mean, I'm confused. So yeah, I'll, there's the the next few slides I think are a little bit more useful in terms of um, like actually why you'd want to to infer a learning rule. This is um, so so I guess I'm setting this up to say that you can classify which learning rule is being used, but in later in the, in the next few papers that I'm going to show you can actually generate optimizers, right? You can, you can not just say which, which one is which, but you can generate a new optimizer. Okay, so this is, this is a preliminary step to the next few slides, okay. Right, yeah. Um, and this is actually, this work actually came after the stuff that I'm gonna show uh, in just a couple of slides. Well, that, but, may that, my, that may explain my confusion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but this is to show that it's, it's definitely possible to do this. Um, so yeah, here's, here's kind of what I was hoping to get to, and that's, um, finding new learning rules. And there's a bunch of different ways that people have done this. Uh, and so this paper is, is kind of a fun title. It's learning to learn by gradient descent by gradient descent. Um, and what, what this is, is you take your standard weight update. So you say, well, the weights, uh, at, you know, time step T plus one are going to be equal to the weights at time step T. Uh, and then you change them by a learning rate. Uh, and then you take the gradient of, uh, f of, of theta of t where f is your network so your network is parameterized by theta and you just look at uh, th this is sort of the standard gradient descent rule um, but instead of using regular gradient descent rules um, this paper argues that we should actually learn an optimizer we should say okay we know what we're supposed to do what the gradients of these weights are but we're going to take that and just throw it into another network given parameters phi and that will tell us how to update these these weights um, so, yeah, it, it, it's basically just saying this shouldn't be just a linear update. We shouldn't just go directly along the gradient. We should plug it into another function and then learn this function. And then the way that they learn it, learn it is with this somewhat hard to understand and complicated computation graph. But they're essentially just opt, uh, updating the network. And then every time they update the network, they say, well, here's how we should have updated the network given you know, the previous step. And then it iteratively optimizes both the network and the function G, which tells the network how to update given its gradients. This is somewhat confusing. So um, I might have not done a great job explaining it, uh, but that's that's kind of the high level gist. And it, it seems to work reasonably well um, on CIFAR 10 and other sort of CIFAR data sets. Um, I do not know how it scales to larger networks. I suspect it probably doesn't work super well, um, but I, I mean, that's just a suspicion. I, it, it could work really well. Um, and it actually outperforms the other optimizers on, on this uh, data set. Cool. So then uh, this is the topic that I presented in the deep dive a couple of weeks ago. And it's the idea of looking for new learning rules based purely on local data, right? So this is, this is how you characterize this function delta W is how you change your weight. Um, and that's the weight from uh, you know neuron I to neuron J. And it's a function of the local variables of the uh, at synapse i to j, and so maybe some global variables theta. And the way this is done in this paper is actually by a genetic algorithm. Um, and there's all sorts of different ways that they parameterize this function here, this function delta w. Um, this is like, or actually, it's this function f, which approximates this delta w. And they train a bunch of different learning rules, local learning rules. Um, the 7, 8, and 16 stand for like 7, 8, 7, 8, and 16 parameters respectively in their uh, function that is determined by a genetic algorithm. And then there's this genetic programming, uh, which I'm not super familiar with the, the idea of genetic programming versus genetic algorithms, but then there's also just regular backpropagation. And so you can see that as you add more tasks uh, during optimization, 
then your optimizers get better and better. And so then they start to approximate backpropagation or the, they, they don't approximate backpropagation, they approximate the performance of backpropagation as you start to look at many different tasks. Um, so that's that's really cool. And this was actually done 30 years ago before I was born. So <laughs> uh, it's uh, good work. <laughs> um, and then this work has been extended as well. So um, there's uh, the, the- Are these after you were born or still before you were born? I think these are in 2000, so just after I was born. Uh, but uh, yeah, so then people have tried other other ways of finding new learning rules. Um, usually they involve some sort of genetic algorithm because it's somewhat complicated to try to learn a learning rule. Um, but I mean, I, I, I definitely think you can you can back propagate through it. It's just somewhat complicated. Um, and Alex, also these were done before like autograd. Alex, what do you mean by a genetic algorithm? Yeah, so it's uh, the genetic algorithm has a bunch of, uh, I think they're, yeah, the, the technical terms, individuals in a population. And so each individual is parameterized by um, a set of variables. And then, it, I mean, you, it's kind of like SIGOPT actually, where you just have a um, whole population and then the top, top uh, individuals in that population are evaluated for their fitness. And then they're allowed to uh, like essentially like breed. And so then, the next generation of individuals comes from maybe the top 10% of the previous generation of individuals. And it's just a combination of all their traits. Um, and the traits can be like, you know, the parameters given uh, the parameters of a function, right? So they can be the parameters of a neural network. They can be parameters of like a parametric function. Um, you know, the weights of a base, weights of several basis functions. Um, these are all things that I, I think, um, and this, and this one they did, uh, or actually it was this one on the right, they did um, sort of basis functions. Um, and then they, the genetic algorithm chooses the weights of the different basis functions. Um, but it's very computationally intensive because you have to compute each, like you have to compute uh, each individual's fitness for every generation, and then you have to uh, do many generations. So it takes it takes a long time before it to converge. Um, but yeah, so what's interesting here is that they actually took the um, evolved, yeah, so they evolved learning rules. Um, and so the delta rule is, I think, uh, the regular sort of heavy and learning rule that, that would have been um, just like, yeah, just a, a very simple heavy and learning rule. And then the evolved learning rule is what they've learned. And there's something uh, somewhat different. I think they used, I think this is a parametric function. It, it's come out very smooth. So that's why I'm saying that. Um, but it's, it's a function of the pre and post synaptic activity. And they get this interesting sort of landscape for weight updates that are dependent on the pre and post synaptic activity. And you can see here, this is very small, but the A and the F rule are both different uh, weight update rules. And the light dotted line up here is the delta rule, which is just the given like heavy and learning rule. And so what they're showing here is that they can actually learn better learning rules by using genetic algorithms. Um, and that's that work is continued over here, uh, which references this paper, but they do both a, uh, just parameterized heavy and learning rule, which is given by these five parameters, uh, A, B, C, D, and then this eta, I think it's called. And then they do another uh, weight update rule used, using a neural network for comparison. And then that that also is trained, I think, using a genetic algorithm. And this is this is trained on a task where I think an agent is running around collecting food. And so it's a little bit different than something like a supervised learning task. It's not actually reinforcement learning. I don't think, but um, what they show is that you can sort of update these weights. I, I, I think it, this is the equivalent of a policy network. So the, these weight updates are used on a policy network, um, but it, it, it's not all the bells and whistles of RL. Um, and, and yeah, basically what they show is that this red line here is their neural network performance. And then this heavy and learning rule is the green one. And then this is just standard, uh, I think back, uh, no, this is, this is no learning, the blue. So the heavy and learning rule actually converges to what no learning would have been after uh, 2.5 times 10 to the fourth time steps. And then this neural network weight updates gets better over time. So they argue that this is just a favorable way of doing it instead of keeping it in this simple parameterized format. So it's just more complex than this one over here. Okay, yeah. Um, so that that's kind of where, uh, the, the main papers that I've, I've looked at and tried to give a high level summary of. Um, there's just a ton of great research out there and I had to leave out a bunch of it. Um, and so that's, that's, that's always, uh, 
pretty sad. And then uh, another concern that I have is that as we stray further from biological architecture, it might be harder and harder to find simple local learning rules. Um, so for example, these are the, some of the questions that um, I think are you know pertinent here is that do we need multiple learning rules for different structures, right? Uh, does it make sense that we just have one learning rule that's applied to every single weight in a, in a neural network? Maybe not. Um, you know, does that in grid cell modules or, or more complicated structures that you might find in the neocortex change the way that we want to uh, use these learning rules? Maybe certain structures require some learning rules and certain other structures require other learning rules. Um, and maybe sparsity matters, right? So maybe these learning rules don't make sense unless you're really close to biology and in biology, there's you know tremendous amounts of sparsity. So this is sort of a hypothesis of mine is that as you get closer and closer to the biology, um, the learning rules will get easier and easier to find and maybe your genetic algorithms will converge faster. Um, this is just kind of a, a general concern after reading a bunch of these papers is that whenever a biologically, biologically plausible local learning rule is proposed, the authors you know, prove that it can work in theory, and then they just go ahead and violate it <laughs> to get good results on some sort of testing data set. And so this is just a general problem with ML research is that everyone's trying to get to you know, really good performance on standard, standard benchmarks. Um, and so then, people end up throwing biological plausibility out the window a lot of the time. And then uh, another sort of meta uh, critique is that uh, maybe finding a local learning rule won't be the ideal world that I imagine. It might actually be just that the entire ecosystem is already based way too much on backpropagation and gradient descent on, uh, you know, on autograd and everything that finding a local learning rule maybe doesn't help <laughs> because we're just already so committed to this idea of gradient descent and backprop. Um, but, I think there's, yeah, some, truth, I think there's some truth to that last comment. Mm -hmm. And it's a good, it's a good observation. I mean, you, you know, it's funny when you think about biological plausibility, biological networks are very um, structured and complex compared to uh, typical deep learning networks. And so we have all these different types of inhibitory neurons that have different rules in which they operate. And there's, they force, they force in some sense, the structure of the networks and the types of different types of neurons forced uh, things to happen that you don't get if you don't have that you know if you just have a multi-layered uh, network you don't have any of that enforced structure uh, rules if you will that and so um and, you know it may be that all pyramidal cells have you know a similar set of learning rules everywhere but and so there might be one learning rule for pyramidal cells but it's not going to work if you don't have the, all the other types of cells and the other different structures and all the things that are going on at the same time so I think your last point there is we're, the current systems are so far from biology that it's not clear how much you can bring those, you know, like a local thing, like a local learning rule into the picture. And maybe you can, maybe you can, I don't know. But it, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be surprised me that, you know, yeah, you're going to run into limits because just the network itself is just totally different. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I think the structure of the network probably, you know, matters a lot, um, especially considering that like for, for some of these things like the predictive coding, you need to actually modify the structure of the network for a learning rule to make sense. So uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that was true for a lot of different cases where your learning rule is just not going to work unless you have a very specific kind of structure. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about like the role of the thalamus now is this is reference rate transforms and so on. So that's a whole part of the system that is just missing completely, you know, even the way grid cells come about, you know, the grid cells are, the, you know, the, the neurons in the grid cells may have some may have very typical learning rules or but there's other structure that make them into grid cells you know it, there are there are, there is differentiation in the cell types in these networks so it's, it's an interesting question like uh, you know, how far can you go applying biological rules to these networks that are not biological and mm -hmm. uh, you know I think we've shown so far with sparsity you can, you can do some pretty cool things um so that's good and i think we i think you know the, we believe we can get a bunch of other stuff going on uh with the dendrites and and reference rate but it's it's unknown actually mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah i guess we just gotta hope that it's it's more universal like sparsity like yeah it seems yeah, to be something yeah. that's very universal and you know it doesn't yeah. doesn't matter that we're so far away from biology right yeah. now or we can shoehorn it in there yeah but yeah. yeah i think i think we got i think we've got enough encouraging results and understanding to think that there's a good chance we can do this. Um, yeah, anyway, interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you know, if they're truly universal in some way, then, you know, there's some hope even in a complex structure like today's structures, maybe we can find our way around it. Um, I had another question, you know, in, in okay. neuroscience and in the biology, there's, you have plasticity 
plasticity occurs at many different time scales. There's the mm -hmm. really fast, you know, weight updates, there's long-term potentiation, there's all these neuromodulators that control the rate at which plasticity happens at a very, you know, kind of local level. Did, did any of these, uh, have, did you run across any papers which try to figure out learning rules at different time scales at all? Yeah, yeah, I did. That's that's definitely part of the, uh, you know, the corpus of research that I had to leave out. Um, but there's, yeah, one one way that a lot of people try to tackle that problem is with with this global neuromodulator. So if you have, um, you know, if you have a network or even something like learning to learn by gradient descent, um, then like that, that uh, I can go back here. Like this phi might include some sort of global modulator and it might say, you know what, every weight update is just, you know, times one over 100, right? It makes some very small weight updates or something, or maybe it adds a bias to the weight updates. Um, and so that's that's kind of the way that it sneaks in there is that you can add this global neural modulator. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, there, what I haven't seen is like a, a big distinction between like kinds of weights. It's, it's usually something like this where right. it, it usually is like a, a global modulator as opposed to, you know, the distinction between like fast and slow weights or like different kinds of weights and different mm -hmm. update rules. It's usually all kind of shoehorned into one one like big function. Yeah, I'm just thinking of like our dendritic networks, you have the feed forward weights and then you have the context weights or mm -hmm. context. Uh, and those might have to evolve at, at different time scales. Um, mm -hmm. I think we, we did that even in our HTM work, you know, the assumption was the spatial cooler stuff was sort of slower in some sense. They're, they're, yeah, yeah, yeah right. they're, you know, they're sort of coming up with sort of basic fundamental features. And then the dendritic weights are the ones that's actually saying, okay, in this context, make this inference. And that could mm -hmm. be a very fast thing. Yeah. 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 Anyone else have any other questions? Yeah, Alex, cool, I have a question. Um, yeah, go ahead, Karen. So mm -hmm. you, you said uh, one, on your very last slide, one of your points was how, um, you know, it doesn't make sense to apply some of these uh, learning rules because we don't have the right structure. Did you come across any work where they're trying to um, improve the structural aspects so that these learning rules or that so that more biologically plausible learning rules could be applied? That's a good question. I think the way that I went about this was by looking along a trail of papers that were all very related to each other without kind of, yeah, I, I, I think there's gotta be something that, that does try to answer that question um, with different structures. But um, I guess given the way that I went doing this literature review, I didn't come across any. Okay. One general yeah, comment or, sorry, did I cut someone off? No, go ahead. Oh yeah, so one question I had was like, I feel like deep learning um, architectures nowadays kind of structure the network so it gives the possibility for something to happen. So for example, like transformers, it gives the network the chance to like uh, weight different parts of like a sequence. And then it kind of hopes that through gradient descent, some it happens upon the solution that we think of. Mm -hmm. Do you think, or do any of the papers you read think that we should induce like a prior on the learning rule itself so that it does or leads to a solution that we think is more suited for a certain task rather than hoping it converges to that by chance. Wait, could you repeat the question? Um, yeah, like- Yeah, I'm um, not sure I understand. So basically like instead of designing a network with mm -hmm. the possibility for certain behaviors to emerge and hoping mm -hmm. that gradient descent converges to those behaviors, is there any work that you read where the updates itself are designed so that it induces certain types of behavior in a network. Hmm. Yeah, I think not not exactly. I think a lot of the papers that I were reading, I was reading were more general and trying to tackle like, does this learning rule even make sense? Can it learn in simple scenarios? And the problem with a lot of these things is that it doesn't scale super well, right? It doesn't scale to like I, I haven't seen anything with specifically like transformers and local learning rules, or maybe like, uh, you know, another example might be like these memory augmented neural networks and local learning rules. Maybe you just add that in there. But um, I haven't seen 
yeah, I, I haven't seen anything that has to do with like trying to prove that certain behaviors will exist given a certain update rule. It's kind of been like, can we make a general update rule or a general optimizer that approximates backcrop or does like better than backcrop in some way, as opposed to like for specific structures, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And a follow-up mm -hmm. question just generally is like in the brain, I guess, is there any evidence that certain parts have an update rule that are um, like for it that are specific to that part of the brain's behavior? Or is it um, specific yeah. to that yeah, part uh, of the brain's behavior? Or I guess if like if a certain part of the brain has a certain role to play, does the up the does the way that part updates um, is that update rule specific to its functionality in well, I, I think you could say there's different areas of the brain that do different functional things and they have different update rules. Yeah, that's nice. um, um, this is not exactly the word you use, but maybe it meant the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, then, the, then the answer would be yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Cool. So I had a question, Alex. Uh, when you were looking at uh, genetic uh, algorithms, uh, what you showed was something where it was uh, um, sampling among parameters. Was there anything that actually looked uh, sampling upon connections? Um, I'm thinking of some of the, the architectures that we've seen in the past that uh, were performant for certain applications like UNETs and things like that, where mm -hmm. you skip over some layers and connect some things. I mean, it would, I, I would think the learning rule for that would be very slow because there's a, if you start forging connections beyond your local layer, uh, there's a vast universe to explore. But I'm curious if uh, uh, anything you saw where they were looking to explore the connectivity uh, with genetic algorithms rather than uh, just parameters. Um, so let me make sure I have your question correct. So when you say connectivity, do you mean connectivity in the network that's being modified or in the network that's doing the modification, like this, this update network? I, I, would, I would say either in, in the sense that, um, I mean, we, you, you kind of stated formally uh, in the beginning that with uh, stochastic gradient descent, typically if the forward network and the back network had to have symmetric weights uh, or symmetric connectivity, but I'm just trying to think if uh, there is a rationale for saying, you know, taking samples outside of your own layer and skipping layers and doing forging those connections, whether it's in the forward or backwards network, whether that's something that's explorable uh, or someone's tried to explore that as a potential uh, mechanism for uh, in, in improving learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I see what you're saying. Um, I, I'll, I'll answer the other question as well, because I think it's somewhat important is the with the update network, um, like a lot of times, or from what I've seen so far, these genetic algorithms um, can't really do a lot because you have to learn, you're learning two networks at once, and this network is really small. So this is, this network architecture is usually fixed, and you just are like learning, you know, a very small number of weights at any given time. Um, but with your, yeah, with your sort of main question, um, I think, yeah, one thing that, I, that somewhat I think relates to what you're talking about is this, the modifications to feedback alignment. There have been a bunch and um, like with the direct feedback alignment, there's that backwards weights going from the, um, from the last layer to every individual layer. But then there's all sorts of combinations where you have weights going from like skipping layers, like you're saying, um, you, have, you have like this B matrix basically people have tried all sorts of combinations of, of like which layers do you skip? Uh, how many layers with this B matrix? Um, is it, what, what's it connected to? Um, there's, there's all sorts of like connectivity that's been tried with the feedback alignment. Um, that's, the, that's the most notable example that's come to my mind. Also with the synthetic gradients, um, people have tried like how much do you back propagate and how much do you use synthetic gradients? And there's, um, there's a trade off there as well. But um, there's, there's been a lot of experimentation. But, but in the in the sense that when they said you know how many layers to skip, it's a um, it's it's a fixed construction rule as opposed to an expl exploration of that dimension, right? Oh yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's fixed in the beginning. Right. So um, 
so one of the you know early examples of genetic networks is when they basically were hooking uh, part of the genetic code was not just set of parameters but uh, subgraphs that got you know kind of uh, became components and then were kind of hooked together uh, somewhat randomly. Mm -hmm. So exploring that kind of space, I was just trying to. I don't know what the biological plausibility of this is, except to maybe find something out, uh, search a larger uh, space of possible connectivities. When I, when I think of all the, what Jeff was referring to is, uh, I mean, beyond the thalamus, just the, the uh, somewhat interesting connectivity that haps, happens through the various layers of the neocortex, you know, would you, you know, from one of these algorithms come up with that kind of connectivity uh, or was it, you know, we're, we're trying to abstract away something that's the, at least the neocortex found to be essential in, in, in performance. So some, sometimes having that kind of exploration structure allows you to get outside of your mindset of uh, extreme symmetry in, in these things. And, you know, well, clearly, clearly, you know, the brain got the way it is through genetic algorithms, right? So, well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, that is the, the, the ultimate, you know, that, that was the motivation for doing genetic algorithms. Yeah. And there's been, there's been a lot of discussion about people saying, hey, could we just do that same process and speed it up and, you know, arrive at, you know, something equivalent to a brain. And, you know, hey, maybe you could, although, you know, it's um, how we got here is a very complex path and we have uh, biological needs of survival and right. all kinds of things that, that um, um, but I wouldn't put it out of the question. It just hasn't been fruitful yet. Uh, and, and most, and again, you know, the whole thing about the genetic algorithms are you, you have to pick what elements can be modified or, or what things you can be tweaking. At. And, and so we, we have this code in biology where you're, you're starting with, uh, you know, sequences of nucleotide or sequences of you know, the, the ATCG code and the, and the DNA and how that maps to the actual structure of cells and all this stuff is really a mystery. Um, so, you know, you could choose a set of say, okay, these are the attributes I'm gonna let my genetic algorithm um, modify, but it, it, very likely you won't, that won't be the right set. It's too constrained. Um, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it, it, the, yeah, I, the, I, I agree. Yeah. It's hard to come up with the right forcing functions, you know, that it'd be, it'd be sort of like saying, you know, I, I need to learn how to write and I'm going to, I'm going to start with these set of words, but maybe that's not the right thing. Maybe you need to start with a set of letters or, you know, a set of phonemes or something like that. Uh, and, um, you know, that's a very, that's a poor analogy, but no, no, I, I think I, I agree that it would be difficult to come up with the right set of forcing functions that say this is the next evolutionary challenge, you know, on the family and, tree. And the right set of elements that you're actually modifying through the evolutionary algorithm. That's, that's I think, is even a bigger problem. Right. Uh, and, and nature's had a had the opportunity to do things in parallel over a geologic time. So yeah, <laughs> and, and again, we're starting with this genetic code, which is incredibly powerful in the number of manifestations it can make, but we don't actually know enough about it to know, you know, what are the, what can it represent? What can what kind of things can the genetic code represent? Could it produce other? You know, anyway, it's just, it, there's a huge gap there, which may be necessary. Uh, the, the 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 explanation between going from genes to you know uh, uh, phenotype is so large that anyway, it's, it's I think genetic algorithms are cool, um, but so far people have tried to sort of evolve brains and it hasn't worked too well. Yeah. Well. Oh yeah. Um, I'm just, you know, uh, it, it's, it's the, the, the current progress I, I think is, is conceptually limited. It's kind of reminds me of the, uh, the early days when they were trying to do, um, uh, voice, uh, 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 basically, uh, audio to, uh, to text and, uh, kind of gave up trying to make, uh, the models of the vocal cords and stuff like that, and just went to pure machine learning algorithms. And those proved out to yeah, be yeah. much, much better. Yeah. And at a, at a meta level, I, I kind of feel we're at the same space here for machine learning, where we're trying to say, well, what, what would look symmetrically good? What would be, you know, functionally good? And, and it's, uh, the, in, in some aspects, some, uh, genetic algorithms allow you to break out of that and uh yeah and, and try things you wouldn't conceive of yeah but it is constrained by your assumptions yeah. 
yeah, you have to have some. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah actually, I've, now out of a better idea of what your, your question was, Kevin, um, I, I should say that the genetic algorithm component was not in, in the papers that I was looking at, it was not on the actual architecture of the network. It was on the, um, it was in the parameters and the uh, of of the update rule, right? It was. Uh, uh, it was that, the that's a good. Rule. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, right. You know, they're yeah. not modifying so then, the network, <laughs> so you're going to exactly. still stay with the same network. It's like if that network isn't going to do it, it's not. No matter genetic algorithm is going to. I mean, that. your topic was the learning rules, right? As opposed to architectural yeah. construction. So it, that's fair. Yep. Yeah. If you look at yeah. the brain, yeah, it is fair. But if you look at the brain, I would say there's a hell of a lot more. Uh, a design into the architecture than into the learning rules. There'll be just a handful of learning rules in the brain, but there's, there's a hell of a lot of architecture that's going on. And so that's where most of the evolution has been occurring. And again, you see that true. Just look at the, you know, our theory about grid cells and play cells in the cortex, right? Uh, so, you know, the learning rules are almost certainly going to be very similar to what existed in the hippocampus and in Toronto cortex. But you know the, the learning that evolved that made mammals with our neocortex and was you know taking those re copying those architectures and wiring them together differently and adding them at different sort of levels and and so it was uh, it was all about you know mammals are not new learning rules mammals are all about architectural changes um, and our intelligence was really evolved in a way that popped out almost exclusively almost certainly vast ninety percent of ninety nine percent of it's going to be architectural changes versus changes mm -hmm. in learning rules. So if you think about it that way, that's a good way to show the limits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I definitely think that's right. I think it's definitely right that the architecture matters a lot. Um, yeah, that was that was kind of this last point, or I don't know where I made this point, but yeah, if the architecture is right, maybe the learning rule gets really simple. Did anyone do, do, do any searching of these learning rules in the context of sparse networks? Yeah, yeah, I did see some stuff there um, and uh, specifically, I saw some papers on sparsity and feedback alignment, um, and I was hoping to see some results that were like sparsity enables feedback alignment to be really good, but uh, it looked like it was the, the reason they did it was mainly for the computational speed up and it actually ended up performing like slightly worse. But then, you know, they could do more iterations in the same period of time. So they were able to justify that. But I don't I don't think it helped in terms of like the, the theory to make it faster convergence. This is that B matrix that go, the one that goes back. Yeah. Right. So, uh, Alex, mm -hmm. we have been talking about GA, and an alternative to that would be uh, meta learning. And you briefly hinted about it when you talk about learning to learn by gradient descent for gradient descent. But there is some mm -hmm. newer work, like uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a Learn Optimizer by uh, Luke Matz. I think that would be interesting to look at or mm -hmm. uh, learning to learn with feedback and local plasticity. So these are more like mm -hmm. recent work following up on that trend and replacing GAs by uh, just meta learning with back propagation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's good. I should probably include those. Uh, and the look Matt's work, I definitely recommend uh, reading it and learn optimizers. I think you'll find it interesting. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and I, I had one question. So in the beginning of the talk, you said you had an idea, but someone beat you to it. So what, what were you talking about specifically? No, that was, that was this year. Um, I, prevented, I sort of presented the, the equivalent of this in, uh, in the deep dive a few weeks ago, uh, where was the, the idea was that you learned this learning rule through a genetic algorithm, and it's purely a function of these uh, sort of local synapses. And this was uh, Yashu Benjo like, uh, in 1990. And then the follow-up work, also uh, did something very similar. This, this, like this one, was trained on a very simple task with a very shallow network. Um, and then I think these learning rules ended up being a little bit more complicated. Not anything like super complicated, but uh, this would have been. I, I forget the example, but it was it was basically like you know two variable addition or something like just a, a toy problem um, or like XOR or something. And then this was actually a data set. Of a very simple, um, yeah, it was a very simple data set. But yeah, this is this is the idea that uh, I presented uh, in in the the deep dive that was actually already done. Mm. Okay. Well, thanks, Alex. Yeah, Alex, that was nice. This is great. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Was great.